I'm Jim Birchler from the University of Missouri. I'm going to tell you a little bit about engineered mini chromosomes in plants and in particular maize and something about the history of their development. One might ask why one would want to make engineered mini chromosomes. These have the potential to put together genes uh, that will add new properties to plants Currently, transgenic plants have basically two kinds of transgenes, one for insect resistance and one for herbicide resistance. And to use a new synthetic chromosome where many different transgenes could be put together as a single unit, uh, including the insect resistance, herbicide resistance, genes for drought stress or other environmental stresses, together with genes for nitrogen utilization, and even other possibilities that we have yet to imagine uh, could be put together all onto a single inherited unit of a engineered mini chromosome. In addition to the practical applications, it is also possible to use engineered mini chromosomes for basic studies. In other words, one can, can make an engineered mini chromosome to one's own specification, designing it the way one wants to learn what the properties of a chromosome are that would allow it to work in particular ways. So we can learn a lot uh, about how chromosomes operate from this kind of technology. In terms of how we got interested in making engineered mini chromosomes, began in the late 1980s when a former graduate student, Mark Alfonito, decided to want, he wanted to do something different from the rest of the lab for his PhD project. So we decided that what he might try to do was to isolate sequences from the supernumerary B chromosome of maize. The B chromosomes are an interesting uh, entity in that they're basically a dead chromosome, but they manage to be maintained in a population because they have properties that basically perpetuate themselves from one generation to the next. And so these are, are bizarre chromosomes and therefore we were interested in trying to learn something about them on the molecular level. So Mark decided to try to find specific DNA sequences that were present on these chromosomes and he succeeded in doing so. And what these particular sequences turned out to be was a specific sequence that was in and around the centromere of the B chromosome, which we now know to be the case. And this turned out to be a very useful uh, finding for the study of centromeres in plants because it gave a particular sequence uh, that the other centromeres in the plant cell did not have, and it has allowed us to study this particular centromere uh, extremely well. And it also allowed us then to understand uh, something about uh, how centromeres work, which I'll get to in just a minute. It was also the instigation for the idea of making artificial chromosomes in plants. Artificial chromosomes, of course, had been made in yeast in the 1980s, and this was a few years later. And here we had identified uh, the first sequences in the plant centromere. And so it was a straightforward idea that we would then use these particular sequences perhaps to try to stitch together an artificial chromosome in plants to see if this could be recapitulated and to be used for those properties that I've already discussed. There are two approaches to making artificial chromosomes. One is to use centromere sequences and to introduce them back into the cell together with other genes of interest and a selectable marker. And the other approach is to take the telomeres or the ends of chromosomes and introduce them into the cell 
and basically cleave off everything of the chromosome except for the endogenous centromere that remains, to which one will attach particular genes. So we tried both of those particular techniques as well as, as others have tried introducing centromere sequences. When we transformed the centromere sequences back into a plant, they would integrate into the normal chromosomes, but we never found an instance in which it would function autonomously. Other people have also tried this approach, particularly uh, Kelly Daw and Wayne Parrott at the University of Georgia, who did a very careful study of taking centromere sequences and introducing them back into maize or into rice. And what one, one gets out of these experiments is an integration into the chromosome without the autonomous functioning of the centromere as a separate entity. In the mid-90s, we decided to also uh, begin to study the other approach of using the introduction of telomere sequences into a plant to cleave off the chromosome arms and introduce at the same time genes that would allow one to engineer any of the mini chromosomes that might be produced. The process by which we derive mini chromosomes begins with the design of a truncation construct. The example here is a truncation construct which would be used by agrobacterium tumefaciens to transform in this D DNA. The DNA has a left and a right border. It has a promoter driving a bar selection gene in this case, and then an important component of this construct is a telomere array. The next step in the process is we excise immature embryos at approximately 10 days after pollination from maize ears, and these embryos are then transformed with agrobacterium or particle bombardment transformation. And these transformed embryos then go through an incubation phase where callus is induced. Callus is essentially a de-differentiated state of the plant tissue whereby efficient selection can be performed in vitro. And during the selection process, those callus that picked up the construct of interest are going to be selected for and everything else is going to die off. These selected callus then go through a process of regeneration whereby we generate young plantlets. These plantlets are then screened by fish and other techniques for the presence of mini chromosomes and the plants that have the mini chromosomes of interest are then regenerated into mature plants in the greenhouse and they are maintained by self-pollination. Juan Vega was a postdoc who initiated this particular project, and we'll come back to this particular approach in just a minute. The integration of these centromere sequences was somewhat of a puzzle at first, but eventually it became known that the centromere has an epigenetic component to it, and our laboratory discovered some of these uh, pieces of data that led to this conclusion. We began uh, simultaneously while we were still doing the telomere truncation approach uh, to developing a technique to paint chromosomes of maize in somatic cells so that we could identify each of the 10 chromosomes that are present in the normal set. This was a very useful technique uh, developed by a former postdoc at Kiyokato and the former graduate student John Lamb. This was accomplished by taking repetitive sequences in the chromosomes and labeling them fluorescently and then doing a, a fluorescent in situ hybridization. And this would decorate the chromosomes in different colors so that each of the chromosomes uh, could be distinguished one from another. This allowed us to eventually uh, discover that some centromeres in particular constructs had become inactive. And once we realized that centromeres could become inactive, we found numerous cases of centromeres that had gone inactive. And this, this revealed to us that this experiment of introducing the centromere sequences into a plant with its integration without functioning autonomously was because of this epigenetic effect upon the, the functioning of a centromere. In other words, the DNA sequence of the centromere did not automatically trigger the functioning of a centromere when that was put back into the plant cell. So this gave us further impetus that the telomere-mediated truncation approach 
was the one that was likely to be successful. And the former postdoc, Wai Chang Yu, succeeded in showing that this was the case. He made constructs that had selectable markers, other genes of interest, and then telomere sequences at one end of the construct. These were introduced into plant cells in uh, one of two ways, either by using the so-called gene gun, where it was blasted into the cells, and then when it integrated into the chromosome, one end of the construct would be fused with the chromosome, where it was going to be integrated, and the other end, where the telomere was present. This would form the end of a chromosome, and it would not fuse with the rest of the chromosome arm, causing then a truncation of that chromosome at that site of insertion and, and eliminating all of the genes that were distal to that site of where it entered into the chromosome. Once these engineered mini chromosomes were produced, they had the ability to have uh, extra sequences uh, inserted into them and uh, Dr. Yu succeeded in demonstrating a proof of concept uh, using the so-called site-specific recombination cassettes that the truncated chromosome could recombine with another site in the genome that would exchange these uh, sequences and allow one then to add new genes to the end of the chromosome using these, as mentioned, site-specific recombination uh, procedures. With the truncation of the B chromosome, the B chromosome, as we have mentioned, has the ability to change in copy number because of its natural accumulation mechanism. When the B chromosome is truncated, it loses this ability, but if you add back normal endogenous, normal B chromosomes, that will supply the function for the engineered mini B chromosome to change in copy number. Now, a former graduate student, Rick Masonbrink, has used this particular property of the engineered mini B chromosomes to drive up the copy number of them. Now this, this could be very useful for uh, increasing the output of any genes that one stacks onto an engineered mini B chromosome by accumulating more and more copies of those genes on this chromosome that one has now amplified in copy number. So he succeeded in, in accumulating engineered mini B chromosomes up to 19 or 20 copies, which is basically equivalent to the normal chromosome number of maize. So it has the normal chromosome set together with an extra 20 engineered mini B chromosomes. So together with engineering the high expression of genes on the engineered mini B, one can also amplify the output if one can avoid gene silencing mechanisms by increasing the copy number of the engineered mini B chromosomes. Some of the current directions that we are pursuing with engineered mini chromosomes is being studied by a postdoc, Bob Gaeta, He's succeeded in demonstrating that one can make these truncated chromosomes by simultaneously transforming the genes of interest together with free telomeres. So this greatly facilitates the ability to make these chromosomes because the, the telomeres do not have to be added to the same constructs before they're introduced into a plant. Now the piece of information of importance is, is that whenever one does a co-transformation with a particle bombardment, the pieces of DNA that are transformed tend to be integrated at the same sites into the chromosomes. Therefore, the free telomeres are fused with the genes of interest and succeeds in truncating the chromosome. And Dr. Gaeta has succeeded in making several engineered mini chromosomes using this partic particular technique in some of them from the A chromosomes and some of them from the B chromosomes. He's further interested and has uh, succeeded in doing a proof of concept that one can modify these engineered uh, mini chromosomes in vivo. One of the 
things that one would want to do with an engineered mini chromosome is to remove the selection marker from it so that either the selection marker can be used again or for practical applications the selection marker is desired to be eliminated. In the future the applications of engineered mini chromosomes is basically limited by one's imagination. The telomere sequence, which we use for telomere-mediated truncation, is uh, very similar across the whole plant kingdom, and therefore the vectors that are used in any one particular project can be transferred to other species, so that there's a whole variety of uh, vectors that are available across the plant kingdom to expand this into uh, whatever application one might want to use it for. Of course, as we make a chromosome larger and larger that is entirely made up of genes as opposed to what a natural chromosome is composed of, namely transposable elements, indeed transposable elements is the primary constituent of normal chromosomes, we don't know how an entirely synthetic chromosome may behave in the cell. And this is an interesting question that will need to be addressed in the future as these chromosomes grow in length uh, with more and more genes. So the potential is that as we can uh, further the technology of engineered mini chromosomes, we can basically add new properties to plants which would have important uh, applications in agriculture and in biotechnology by adding whole biochemical pathways or to use plants as a factory for important proteins or for uh, important metabolites. So our hope is, is that we can, uh, as time goes on, uh, continue to explore uh, new ways to uh, uh, develop these engineered mini chromosomes. I'm a mini chromosome short and stout. Got new genes with the old cut out. Telomeres added to make new ends. New genes there when chromosome mends. Pile on the genes one by one. Keep on adding until you're done. Make a new chromosome bit by bit. They're so cute, they're quite a hit. I'm a mini chromosome short and stout. Got new genes with the old cut out.